This is going to be an exciting one. In this video, I'm going to give you my review of the GF 55mm 1.7 lens. First, I want to give a massive shout out to Fujifilm who was awesome enough to send me this lens back in October to test out for a few weeks just after it was released as well, so thank you so much. Before we get into this review though, if you are new to this channel, my name is Mike and I primarily review Fujifilm GFX gear, a little bit of X-Series gear, and some other camera accessories. So if that sounds like your speed, hit that subscribe button to follow along, as well as please the YouTube gods to spread this video to other people like you. Now, let's jump into the specs and build of this lens. Officially, this is the GF 55mm f1.7 RWR lens. The R meaning aperture lens and WR meaning it's weather resistant. This is a 44mm equivalent lens. It has a large aperture of f1.7 and goes all the way up to f22. 1.7 is the largest aperture on the Fujifilm system, at least at the time of recording this video. Only this lens, the GF55 and the GF 80 millimeter have this large aperture, but it is closely followed by F2 on the 110 lens. The GF55 weighs in at 780 grams or 1.71 pounds. So it's not really a light lens per se, but it's not really in that heavy tier of the GF110 and other lenses that go past 1,000 grams. And lastly, this lens has a decently fair MSRP of $2,300. This lens has a top-notch finish, very premium feel, and if you are familiar with GFX glass, you'll be right at home with this lens. So I just switched views and switched cameras. We're recording on the GF55 mm 1.7, and we're on the GFX 100S body. To briefly talk about the autofocus sound of this lens, I placed my camera and the lens on the desk, and I'm gonna shift the focus points pretty drastically. This lens isn't silent, but it is much quieter than most GFX glass. It's on the quieter end of the spectrum, and it is substantially quieter than its big brother, the 80 millimeter, which is a very loud lens. So I'm not a lens scientist, I'm just a random guy talking to a camera on YouTube, but I can say that if Fujifilm put in a linear motor on this lens, it would probably be a little bit quieter, similar to the GF110, which is definitely a very quiet focusing lens. To briefly talk about autofocus, Fuji definitely implemented some new tech into this lens because the autofocus is really great. I already recorded a few videos with this lens and some are already up on my channel. The eye focus is amazing. It does not miss. I basically shoot wide open and the eye focus nails it every single time. There's no searching. If I move in frame, it catches it. It's a really great lens for autofocus. So let's do a quick eye focus test so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's briefly talk about this lens in terms of studio performance. So I set up two scenes in the studio to test out this lens. It seems that every time I have a lens to review, I never have anything fun to shoot in the studio. But I digress. Let's jump into Lightroom and take a look at some of these images. Okay, so in this first example, we just saw images cycling through every single aperture this lens has. So let's jump into Lightroom real quick and starting with wide open at 1.7, which you're most likely not gonna do in the studio unless you wanted some sort of specific look. Um, zooming in to 100%, we have the center of the can, super sharp. So wide open and we're at 300% here. You can basically see the imperfections or the, the fine details of the paint that the human eye cannot see with 100 megapixels. But this looks really good, actually. Definitely really, really sharp, but back to 100. We do have a large fall off to be expected with 1.7, but obviously this is just very extreme due to the extreme depth of field here. Um, we can't really make out any of the LEDs on this panel. Um, we can make out this was in the same plane of field, but um, we do have just really extreme edge 
and this background looks really nice. Um, let's jump up to 2.8. So again, zooming in and same thing, center is really sharp, but the, the fall off is again, pretty extreme. Most likely you're gonna be shooting much higher than this. But as you can see, the LEDs are starting to come in a little bit more, but still way out of focus. And jumping to F4, the can is obviously more in focus. The edges are still blurry, but starting to come into shape. And the LEDs are, again, still coming into shape back to 1.7. As you can see, big difference here. And let's jump up to F8. So at F8, if we zoom in, once it hits the focus, um, the can is starting to look like it's almost all in focus at F8. It's still a little blurry on the edge and the LEDs are really starting to come in here. So again, everything looks pretty solid so far. Um, very sharp lens. And let's jump up to F11. So typically I tend to shoot, if we're doing some sort of studio, um, you know, some sort of still life or product shoot. Um, I typically shoot at around F11. And as you can see, the can almost looks like it's fully all in focus. Um, we do have a little bit, uh, a little soft on the very edge. Um, not seeing any chromatic aberrations. Um, I didn't mention that. We'll, we'll go back and look at the 1.7 in a second. Um, obviously, the LEDs are starting to look like LEDs and everything is starting to, to really be pretty sharp. Um, let's go to 16. So 16, beyond 11, um, you do start to get, depending on the lens, you start to get a bit of uh, image degrade, diffraction going on. Like this R doesn't look great. If we go back to F11, yeah, the R looks better. Um, I think it's starting to, starting to reach that territory of diffraction and where the image does lose quality, but you do get more in focus. And jumping to F22, Obviously, you should not be shooting at f22. As you can see, um, we lost a lot of sharpness in the center of the can, which was the focus. It never changed. Um, the can does look sh like quote unquote sharp edge to edge, but diffraction is obviously taking a hit on the sharpness. Um, but everything, generally speaking, looks pretty sharp. The LEDs look pretty good here. Um, if I was to really shoot this exact scene, I would shoot at probably f4 and focus or i'm sorry probably f11 and focus stack it um, let's just take a look at f uh, 1.7 and if you watched my video on the 110 versus the 80 millimeter um, you'll see you'll remember that we had a ton of chromatic aberrations on the 80. it looks like we have just a small amount of magenta here unless i'm seeing things um, but it's like basically non-existent compared to the 80 which basically every single image you take wide open is gonna fringe like crazy. So this, I would not, it, it obviously is slight. You can't even really see it at 100. Um, so this lens is definitely a substantial upgrade. And jumping into our second example, I believe I set the focus point to the this side of the lens or the grip, I'm not sure. Most likely that side of the lens, but as you can see, these are on the same plane of focus. So um, pretty extreme image here. Um, if we zoom in, sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, dust this lens before I took the, uh, the image, but um, the photo rather. But these look super sharp, these numbers and massive fall off. I'm not seeing any chromatic aberrations on this image specifically. I think it's easier to see it in text or maybe just a slight slight up here. Super slight. Fuji definitely um, fixed this. I'm not sure if, they, if it's using the same exact type of motor lens elements as the 80, but um, you know, like scientifically exact, but I know we know they're similar to some degree, but um, yeah, this looks really good. Uh, maybe, maybe slight, slight green here, but you know, not nothing, nothing screaming out at you to be honest. Um, this is at 1.7, jumping to 2.8, zooming in to 100. Obviously, we have more of the the letters and numbers in focus. Um, it looks like the fringing is gone, or or like cut by like 80 percent 
and some of this grip is obviously super sharp, but nevertheless, kind of similar. Um, jumping to F4. Naturally, we have more and more of the camera in focus. Um, everything looks pretty solid here. Um, we're shooting at ISO 100, obviously, to keep the noise super down as we're in the studio. And let's jump up to F8. Uh, we almost have the whole front lens in focus. Uh, we're getting there. But overall, I mean, this lens is just super, super sharp. It obviously has an extreme depth of field, but very sharp. And F11, once this fully loads. Um, yeah, progressing nicely. Looks like we're up to about here in focus and it starts to get a little, just a little soft. But overall, um, I would probably, if I wanted to actually shoot this uh, in this exact state and scene, I would basically shoot at F11 and focus stack it. But this looks pretty good. F16. This, this camera is on such an extreme angle, the subject camera. So I don't really expect everything to be fully in focus once we hit F22, but we can definitely start to see some diffraction going on here. Um, this looks sharp, but it looks like it's a little bit blurry. So, I mean, this is not surprising. It's not a negative thing on this lens at all. It happens with all lenses. I'm pretty sure it happened with the 110 and the 80 as well. And zooming in at F22, at 100%, you know, F22, you would, you shouldn't be shooting at this, but the whole camera overall looks decently sharp. Almost, almost sharp edge to edge. You do have a couple pieces that are a bit, bit blurry. Like this maybe a little bit, but yeah, F22. Overall pretty solid. I'm really impressed with this. Let's also take a look at some street photography. This way we can test things like sharpness, bokeh, depth of field, and more. Before we jump into Lightroom, I wanna take a second and tell you about this video sponsor, Alan David Custom. As a user of medium format cameras, you undoubtedly appreciate quality, and that's what Alan David Customs is all about. Their specialty is making fully bespoke suits, custom 100% hand-sewn garments with a full canvas construction. And they are locally made in New York City, backed by four generations of expertise. I am super fortunate enough to be wearing one of their suits right now let me walk you through the process and show you how it was made located a few blocks away from grand central in manhattan at 16 east 40th street alan david is a family-owned business that's been around since 1926. during the first appointment we discussed the requirements and chose the fabric starting with my suit and vest material then the dress shirt the next step was to develop a pattern that's unique to me they took all my measurements first, then I tried on a set of sample clothes where they further refined the details. Lastly, we selected the perfect material for my custom tie and picked the shape that would look best for me. I came back a few weeks later to try on the real garment, which was super exciting. Just a few minor adjustments were needed, and it goes without saying, but I've never tried on any clothing that fit me this great. About two weeks later, the suit was ready for one last fitting, so I headed over to try on my three-piece suit, dress shirt, and tie, this time it fit perfectly, so they packed it up and I took it home. I could not be happier with the results of this suit. The fit is truly amazing. They did such a fantastic job. So if you are in the market for a suit, definitely check them out. I'll link to their website in the description of this video below. They offer a free virtual consultation on their website. So check them out, start the process to get your own bespoke suit. Starting with this image of the sign. I talked about this in my pixel peeping video, but just to quickly go over it, um, we're at 200% here and basically the entire sign or the entire lettering of the sign is sharp from edge to edge. Actually, it looks like there's a little bit of fringing on this top part. Maybe super slight. I'm seeing some green here, a little bit in the, the bokeh, but again, we're at 200% here. You can't even see it on this lip of the sign. Um, maybe you could see it a little bit in the bokeh. But overall, that might be also this green, might, this teal might be because of the teal at the top. So, um, but yeah, this is sharp edge to edge, which is pretty cool because it's not really technically straight on. The camera is not straight on. So I'd imagine uh, my focus point was in the middle. So we have a little bit of, you know, this is more towards the camera. This is a little further away, pretty extreme, but we are at 1.7. So I think that this is really solid. 
Also, there's obviously a great amount of separation between this sign and the top of the bridge. So you're really giving a large emphasis on this sign when shooting wide open um, and really, you know, taking, uh, creating that separation. So this shot um, also touched on it. I touched on most of these in the uh, pixel peeping review, so we won't go too deep. But um, yeah, obviously I set the, the plane of focus right here. So if we zoom in, that is obviously sharp but uh, the rest of the image is obviously not at all. Um, and these images, I don't know, they're kind of cheesy, but I like them. Um, really nice, uh, crazy depth of field here, being at 1.7. And obviously I fixed, uh, fixed, I expanded this in Photoshop, but moving on to the next similar style of shot here. Um, same thing, if we zoom in to 100%, um, this was obviously at night, so we are at 500 ISO, which is not too bad. This was the original, so I did bring it out, um, did bump it up quite a bit, but overall um, pretty sharp, obviously a bit grainy because it's at night, but um, decently sharp uh, at 100%. Um, you know, looks pretty solid of an image. Really nice bokeh. Um, I love this, super nice. Um, also to just keep with uh, changing the order a little bit to keep with um, low light. So obviously I took this inside and we were at 400 ISO. So if we zoom in here, the grain is obviously substantially less because it's a better lit area. But um, if we zoom in at this flag, I'm pretty sure the focus point must have been around here because this is really sharp. And as we move towards the other end, um, you know, more out of focus, but overall, um, I don't know what that is. Overall, uh, really sharp quality results here. Um, if you look at the top lights, they are obviously a bit soft to be expected. And if we look over here, soft as well. So pretty nice step to field, like with this lens shooting wide open, um, this foreground is pleasantly out of focus and this is soft enough to really set the emphasis on this flag. On to a daylight picture. So I'm pretty sure I set my focus to this building. So at 100%, um, we could see this looks really sharp for sure. Um, this gets a little bit soft as we get towards the edge of the frame. The trees are moving, so they're a bit blurry, but this whole building looks to be pretty sharp and we're wide open, so that's pretty cool. And the Foreground is obviously crazy blurry, really giving the focus to this building. So I thought this is a pretty neat shot. And this shot here, obviously the focus was this piece of barbed wire right here. And zooming into 200, um, we could see, obviously it's in focus. And the rest of the image is completely blown out of focus. So this is a pretty, pretty uh, extreme image, but I just wanted to show you what could be possible with this 1.7 and shot this at 1.7 as well. So if we zoom in to the bottom, um, it looks kind of sharp. Let's just bump this up. Yeah, overall this looks sharp. Um, bottom sharp as we work our way up. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, it looks like it's all super sharp. This starts to get, this building, upper building looks like it's a little soft. Yeah, it looks soft. So my focus point must have been here at the bottom and gets soft um, as you progress to the sides and the top. But overall, I mean, this looks really great. Um, super happy with the results of this image. <clears throat> and I took, I'm pretty sure my focus must have been on this eagle. So if we zoom in, um, we're at 200%, super sharp. Um, super sharp, pretty much beak to wings. Um, really sharp. And obviously the background is nicely out of focus. So we're given a really big priority to this eagle, really big hierarchy. And if we look up here, again, just a little soft, um, but overall, I think this is a super sharp lens. And uh, yeah, this looks really great. I'm starting to think that I'm not giving the best examples because I only shoot wide open. Um, but it is a 1.7, so I, it's kind of justified. Um, the next review, I'll try to try to mix it up a little bit more. But um, zooming in on these birds, pretty sharp. Not bad. Um, we're at 200%, so let's just do, go to 100. 
yeah, I mean, at 100%, you wouldn't know that they were, this guy's a little, little soft, but these two are sharp. Um, the sign, a little soft. Um, pretty extreme between the birds and the building. So I took this at a park uh, of my dog, Duncan, and obviously this is just super pleasing. Um, the foreground is super out of focus. We just have a pretty narrow plane um, where Duncan is standing pretty much and his head is super sharp, um, pretty much ears to nose, pretty sharp. And the buildings are really, really out of focus. So this is just a really, really great example of how epic this lens is. I'm just really happy with this image. I obviously Photoshopped out this leash at one point, um, but we're just taking a look in Lightroom. So all that stuff's done in Photoshop. Um, you also have this kind of like swirly bokeh going on. And here, I'm just gonna give you a short gallery of a bunch of shots taken with this lens, the GF55. Before we get into the verdict, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the older brother of this lens, the GF 80mm 1.7. The GF 80mm is truly a phenomenal lens, but it does have some pretty big flaws. It is not a clinical lens, which most people would describe the GF 1 10mm to be. This is something that really divides people. The major decision in picking the GF 110 or the 80mm, lots of people love the 110, but people in the 80mm camp say that the 110 is too clinical, meaning it's just perfect, but too perfect. The 80 millimeter does have some character. It's not perfect. And that's why some people choose that lens over the 110. I have a whole video on the GF 80 versus the 110. I'll link it up there and in the description below if you wanna check that out. But back to the 55 and the 80 millimeter, obviously these lenses share some characteristics. Both have the same large aperture of F 1.7 and go up to F 22. And they are pretty much identical in weight. The GF 55 again weighs 780 grams and the GF80 weighs 795 grams, which is pretty much a negligible difference. So let's call it about even. They also have the same filter thread size of 77 millimeters, which is kind of unfortunate in my opinion. If Fujifilm just made these lenses have an 82 millimeter filter thread size, then we can avoid step up filters, but I kind of digress there. So the 80 millimeter does have some pretty substantial flaws. The first being the chromatic aberrations. This lens when shooting wide open will have crazy amount of fringing, but it is really easy to fix in post. Nevertheless, it is still kind of annoying, especially when the price point is beyond $2,000. The second would be the autofocus. The autofocus is not bad if you're doing a, you know, simple moving subject, like kind of like this talking head to the camera, but compared to that of the 110 or even the 120 macro. Um, surprisingly, the 120 has pretty sharp autofocus. The 80 falls pretty short. I am really happy to report that despite being similar lenses, the GF 55 millimeter does not have these problems. The autofocus, especially in video, I'm talking to you right now, GF 55 is actually pretty good. It's really solid. I don't really notice a ton of misfocusing or shifting or anything like that. And the fringing on this lens is really, really, really minimal. You have to look really hard to find it. And when you do, you're zoomed in at like 200 or 300%. And at that point, you're pixel peeping. In most scenarios, you're not really gonna notice it. It's not really that big of a deal. So ultimately this lens did fix the fatal flaws that the GF80 had, and that's pretty cool. So what's the verdict? Well, if you couldn't tell by now, I am absolutely blown away by this lens. I really didn't expect it to be this good. So I've been testing out the GFX system since spring of 2021, and ever since then, I've been hooked. In the fall of that year, they announced this lens. So before I made the decision to purchase my own GFX, I was plotting and trying to figure out which lenses I would purchase if I did buy the system. And I came to the conclusion that I would wanna buy the 55 1.7 
instead of the GF45 2.8. Don't get me wrong, the 45 is a phenomenal lens, but I figured I would want the better low light performance and you know, I just really like bokeh a lot. So I stuck with my guns. When I bought the GFX 100S, I did not buy the 45. I put my stake in this lens, hoping that it would be the one. So I had really high expectations, but I really didn't expect it to be this good. The GF55 is hyper sharp, has great autofocus, great bokeh, and it's not even that heavy. This is truly a 10 out of 10 lens. I would say if you haven't considered this lens, you should really consider picking one up for yourself. After I sent this lens back to Fuji, I did some thinking and I bought my own lens. If you come from owning the GF 80 millimeter, this lens also being a 1.7 fixes those two issues of autofocus and fringing. And honestly, if you told me that this lens was an F2, I wouldn't be surprised. It's kind of like a younger brother to the GF 110. It's pretty much clinical. To give an ultimatum, if you love the 40 to 45 millimeter focal length, this lens is absolutely for you. I'd run to the store and pick one up. Did you buy the GF 55 or are you thinking about it? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to have a discussion about this lens. Make sure you're subscribed if you aren't. Hit that like button if you found this video helpful and I will catch you in the next video.